Hello, I'm Earl Weinberg, and this is Book Circle Presents The Cavalry Cycle. This time we'll continue our reading of Starry Yule, Charlie Horse. The base for the telescope was already there under its own shroud of tarps. Soon they had the telescope mounted and shrouded again. That's it until tomorrow night, Penelope declared. Come back down to my house and have something to eat. I heard your stomach rumbling. In fact, I think I heard both rumble, and I know how much provender you lads take. Penelope's house was a cottage between the woods and a road. On the opposite side of the road, as with Charlie Horse's home, lay farm fields giving good skies, though only western ones. Inside, kitchen and living room were one area. There, Penelope fed Charlie Horse two microwave dinners and all her oatmeal. He declined more, not on the grounds of being full, but because he didn't want any more in his bellies when he galloped back home. Penelope then found her DVD of Guys and Dolls, and skipping through, they sang Fugue for Tin Horns, Oldest Established, Luck Be a Lady, and Sit Down, You're Rocking the Boat. She sang sitting on her sofa. He sang, tucked up before it like a very large dog. She had offered him the sofa, it was large enough, but he was not sure it was sturdy enough. How do they have you set up at home, she asked. Charlie Horse had never been good at lying. He had formerly been good at evading, muttering irrelevancies and falling silent, but he had been practicing hard against that for the last several months and was worse than ever at lying. They didn't know I was coming. She looked her puzzlement. My Uncle Mark set everyone's email to route my messages to spam after my first message home, and I think he must have deleted that one on red. Everyone was very surprised that I showed up. Penelope knew as well as any Grand Norman that the dedicated cavalry was not viewed with universal approval, and she had heard stories from Captain Fletcher. What is your uncle's objection? Grotesque, perverse, and disgusting are the words that stick in my mind. Everyone seems to be in exactly the same positions they were when I left. They were upset then, and they're upset now. I trust they were able to calm down for a while in between. And your parents? Charlie Horse had never mentioned his family, and now she saw why. I haven't seen them tonight. In the weeks before I left, my mother didn't want to be in the same room with me, and my father was polite and smiling when he spoke to me, but he hardly ever did. That's not as bad as it sounds. We were never very close. I was raised by my Aunt Lou, really, my mother's aunt. How did she take it? She died the year before I decided to join. Penelope was silent for a bit, then said, I'm sorry. If you would, please tell me something about your family so I can understand the situation better. I admit to being nosy. It's just two big families that intermarried some and set up a joint household in two neighboring houses and he enumerated the three couples and their children. Penelope came from a large family herself. They were common among Grand Normans, but it sounded to her as if Charlie had become rather lost in this one. So where are you sleeping tonight, she asked, getting back to the original point. I'm camping in the backyard. I thought about using the garage, but it's pretty bleak. You can stay here, she said, before he had quite closed the sentence. Christ, she thought, you'd stable an ordinary horse better than that. He blinked at her. No, no, th thank you, but no, it's just for tonight, and the night will be over soon. I should give them a chance, he muttered. Penelope affected not to hear. Well, she paused. Please, come back tomorrow night. You should see the fruit of your labor, and if it's more convenient, please stay here. She almost started to apologize for it being cramped, but did not want to underscore comparison with being outdoors in the snow. This was no way to end a visit, she decided, so she pressed two rounds of hot chocolate on him and turned the conversation to her work, his classes, and cavalry-based gossip. Then it was time to go home, Charlie insisted. Well, at least you don't need to gallop all the way. Galloping's fun, really, but I pace myself and trot half the time, all part of the training. Good night, and thank you. Thank you. 
and out into the snow. But once he was out of range of the porch light, Charlie Horse circled around and went back up the path to the hilltop. The late winter morning was a twilight when Charlie Horse came home, neither galloping nor trotting, but walking. Lights were still on in both houses, or on again, and his eldest brother Oliver was shoveling the walk in front of the Darnley house. He stared at what looked like his youngest brother on horseback. That's a good glamour, Oliver said. What's it cast on? This bandana, he fingered it. The cavalry subsidizes them. Oliver nodded. And seemings? Seemings fooled space and touch, as well as light and sound, and were exponentially more expensive. They were also useless here. Seemings that revert the transformation don't work or break down, Charlie Horse told his brother. Something out there seems to take exception, even when the transformation spell is over and the magic is done. Otherwise, you can be sure I'd have put a down payment on one. Is everyone up? Oliver nodded again. Lily's in a dither. Why? Afraid you'd run off. I texted her. I said I was seeing a friend. She could have called or texted. Or has Uncle Mark buggered those up, too? Don't think so. And Oliver started shoveling again. Is there anything for breakfast? Oliver stopped to look up at him curiously. What do you mean? I mean, I know I'm late for breakfast, but I'm hoping there's some leftovers. Otherwise, I'll make my own. Oliver leaned on the shovel and looked Charlie Horse up and down. How? He looked skeptical, which was understandable. This was actually an improvement. Charlie Horse's three older brothers had not argued with him much about joining the cavalry, but that was because they had written him off as some combination of ridiculous and unfathomable, unfathomable well before he signed up, and more so after. At least they had not regarded him as a contamination or a disgrace to the family. Like this, he answered. He trotted down the, to the side door of the Darnley house. He removed the kerchief as he went, melting into his stranger, truer appearance. He opened the door and entered, removing his hat, ducking, and, as promised, knocking the snow off his hooves as he came in. Then he sat, though with four legs up, thus, thus reducing his footprint on the kitchen floor. There was a hanging lamp in the middle, which was a nuisance, but you put up with it. Ducking, reaching, twisting, sometimes sliding a bit without getting up, he proceeded to make himself a large quantity of toast and eggs. Oliver stood in the door watching. You look like a cat trying to get comfortable in a shoebox, he said. Charlie Horse met his gaze with raised eyebrows, but merely held up a box and asked, Is this all the oatmeal there is? I go through a lot of oatmeal. Come in and close the door. I won't trample you. Oliver obeyed, retreating to a corner to watch. You're getting your rump dirty, he observed. His expression said he found his transformed brother ridiculous, but interesting. Is it my fault if people track mud into the kitchen? Coffee? Tea? I'm having milk. It was more filling. No thanks. Good Lord! Cousin Beverly, daughter to Nathan and Constance, had just entered, or tried to. Hello, Bev! Charlie Horse had just picked up a fork and a plate of scrambled eggs, but paused to observe her reaction. She had been among those who found the idea of his transformation repellent, disgusting. Nothing appeared to have changed in that regard. She looked as if he were eight and had brought a particularly large toad into the kitchen. Did you want something? I can hand it to you. Don't worry, my hands are clean. Bev was still speechless. Don't worry, Oliver echoed from the other side of the kitchen. He's tame. This was the most supportive thing Charlie Horse had known him to say. The irony in his tone indicated Oliver found Bev's reaction silly. Bev was still reacting. Apparently, she had not got a good look at him last night. Probably she had not wanted one. But now, her gaze helplessly traveled up and down the length of him, trying to sort out man and horse. This was, Charlie Horse knew, a fairly common reaction in people seeing the likes of him for the first time, but it had a special meaning coming from Bev. Holding the plate in one hand, he hiked to the hem of his t-shirt with the other, he had removed his jacket in the warm kitchen, and displayed the hairline between man and beast. See? No stitches, no scars, I told you. During the furor before he left for Uffham and transformation, 
Bev, Bev had voiced an old rumor that the transformation was done by magically assisted surgery, cobbling together a man and a horse. Charlie Horse had known little of horses at that point, but even then, the idea of being permanently incorporated into such a sacrifice had horrified him. Anyway, the story was just an old piece of Ananerba propaganda left over from World War II. He felt she was deliberately looking for the worst light to cast on things. You're impossible, she exclaimed, retreating. No, just mythological, he said to the closing door. To Oliver, I wonder what she wanted. Out, I expect. You rather bottle up the house sitting there. Give me a minute. I'm leaving after I shovel this in. Ten minutes later, he had donned jacket, hat, and glamour, and was back outside heading for the village of Dimble Abbots. There, that had been no way to win Bev over, he reflected. On the other hand, a glare of loathing was no greeting for a cousin just come home on Christmas leave. Of course, finding fault with him was a long-standing hobby of Bev's. But as a good Christian monster, it was up to him to offer peace. He sighed. Bev loved flowers, kept the yard blooming when it wasn't cold, and when it was cold, made her room into something of a greenhouse. He knew she spent winter gloating and plotting over flower catalogs. He would find out from Lily which ones she got and get her a subscription to a new one for Christmas. Maybe something featuring hybrids or grafting. He thought how many thousands of times he had walked this road to the village. Now, as in the yard at home, and of course in the kitchen, the perspective was different, higher. No doubt the footing felt different, but he couldn't really remember what human feet felt like. He was going to the grocer's to stock up on oatmeal and replace the bread, eggs, and butter he had consumed. How he would do this was an interesting question he had not yet answered. The village of Dimble Abbots was very tiny. Decorated for Christmas and generously layered in snow, it was as charming as could be asked. Charlie Horse looked about and entertained a sort of sideways nostalgia about it. If or when he mustered out of the cavalry, it would be nice to settle, not here, but in a place like this, but sundered or somewhere off zone. People noticed what looked like a man on horseback, of course. Several waved. He smiled and waved back. That was pleasant, even if it was false pretenses. If he took off the kerchief and dropped the glamour, the onlookers would certainly be shocked. But would they register wonder rather than dismay? Of course, it was not a good idea, and if he tried it, the sundering would probably see to it that the kerchief knotted. Here was the grocer's. Now what? He was concocting a plan to phone the store and ask for the groceries to be brought out to him under some excuse still to be supplied, when a young female voice said, Charles Darnley. He turned. It was Janet Burton, a young woman about his own age. She lived along the road to his home, and it was the sight of her horse that had started the line of thought that led him here. He smiled gamely. After all, he had expected this sort of thing, though not this very thing. Hello, Janet. Yes, it's me. I haven't seen you since last spring, when you said you were going to join the cavalry? She looked him over, or rather, she looked over the edited image the glamour provided, a bipedal version of himself seated on his own back in the clothes he now wore and a copy of sc standard cavalry trousers and boots. The image focused its eyes on her, and his voice seemed to come from its mouth. It was a good glamour. She looked puzzled. The glamour deleted the Grand Norman military insignia from the image, but the result certainly didn't look like any uniform worn by a cavalryman of the British military. She would have to assume that, at home on leave, he was wearing civvies. At least, that's what he would say if asked. She approached and stood about a yard away. He had to turn further to keep facing her as she faced his edited image. Well, welcome back, she said. Home for Christmas? Exactly. And they let you bring your horse? She asked rhetorically, envy and appreciation in her voice. Oh, yes, um, part of the training program. We're bonding. And he's a stallion, she noticed. I didn't know they really used those in the cavalry. Charlie Horse wanted to tuck his tail in, but refrained, since a horse simple wouldn't. Yes, but he's a good boy, or tries to be. 
Can't ask for more. Some days Cavalier just wants to be a brat. How is Cavalier? Fine. We took a first and a couple of seconds in dressage at an event last month. He'd look very dainty to you now if you're used to this fellow. Charlie Horse blinked. Cavalry had, Cavalier had seemed huge when he, still human, had encountered the gelding last spring. What's his name? Uh, Ch Charlie Horse. He should have expected that question. Really? Did they let you name him then? No, someone else named him for me. May I pet him? Not the head. Charlie Horse said hastily, since that, like his own imaged rider, was artistically colored air and no more. He's head shy. The shoulder's fine. He gestured toward his equine shoulder and saw his image do the same, angles intelligently adjusted. He got petted. This could have been a cheap thrill if he had not been worrying about glamour failure. May I ask you a favor, he said as she withdrew. What? I don't see any place to tie up. This was fortunately true. Could I ask you to go in there and get a couple of big cartons of oatmeal and a loaf of bread while I wait here? He fished a ten-pound note out of his jacket pocket. The eggs and butter, he now felt, would be pushing it. Oh, sure. She took the note and re-entered the grocer's. Charlie Horse looked around. He tried to appreciate Dimble Abbott's without missing it. Would people think it odd if he came back every once in a while, but always on horseback? Odd did not matter to the sundering, though. Odd would be fine. His phone chimed. Did you go straight home from my place last night? He smiled and texted back, Happy Christmas. After a bit came the reply, I was never one of those little girls who asked for a pony for Christmas. I now see this was an oversight. Thank you. Please come tonight. I certainly shall, he texted back. He looked at the sky. Last night's heavy overcast was thinning out, giving way to blue in the west. Alpha per se, here we come. Janet duly came out of the grocer's and handed him a bag and his change. This required him to twist at the waist in a way that it would have earned a sound, well done, Mr. Darnley, from Lieutenant Sanders, so he could fit his right hand into that of his apparent self. He tucked the bag into the crook of his arm and mimed holding the reins in his left hand, and the glamour apparently did the rest. You should get some saddlebags, Janet opined. Oh, sure, and be asked why he didn't dismount to pack them. Right, was all he said. Thanks for introducing me to Charlie Horse. He's a nice looking fellow, big burly bloke, but has a kind eye. The real Charlie Horse felt himself blush with irrational pleasure. Thank you. So he got a cheap thrill after all. On leaving Penelope's cottage, Charlie Horse had trotted up the path to the hilltop and examined the tarped up bundle of materials for the shelter. It was, as he hoped and suspected, a kit, complete with instructions. They looked simple, as if one person could put up the shelter unassisted. The kit even included a screwdriver and a wrench. He set to work. The kit did not include a lantern. At first he used the light on his phone, strapping the phone to one of the uprights with a spare-ish bung bungee cord, but the battery could only last so long. When it went, the dark would be nearly as deep as when the lorry left him at home. He looked around. At the edge of the trees, watching, were a large rabbit and a thing like a knee-high scarecrow made of sticks and weeds. He had noticed them before, but it was often polite to ignore such folk. Now he looked over their heads and said to the air, return and we return. After a bit of stir, the rabbit answered, keep faith and so do we, in a fairly human voice, the stick figure piped along. I would be grateful for a bit of help, Charlie Horse remarked. What kind of help? The rabbit asked. Grateful how? Asked the stick figure in a voice like creaking wood. You know Penelope Argyris, the star mage? Both nodded. I'm building this for her. I could use a lantern and a snow shovel. She has both on her porch. If other folk fetched them for me, I could keep working and it would go faster. And I could sing for them. Let's hear a bit of singing, demanded the stick figure. Charlie Horse gave them Good King Wenceslas. All folk like tales of generosity, but especially these folk. 
different kind of voice, remarked the rabbit, than traded looks with a stick figure, or one so supposed, the stick figure had no obvious face, and then said, deal. The two faded into the shadows and returned two minutes later with the LED lantern and the previously maligned snow shovel. As he worked, he sang The Twelve Days of Christmas, The Holly and the Ivy, Gabriel's Message, Il est né le divin enfant, O come, O come, Emmanuel, En flambeau, Jeanette Isabella, and on through all the other carols he could recall. Eventually, he had to circle back to Wenceslas. But fortunately, folk who had seen the season's circle since before Britain was an island did not mind repetition. In fact, they joined in, first in the singing, then in the work. This was the very thing Charlie Horse had been hoping for. With such help, the job went very quickly. When the shelter was up and shoveled out, he bowed to both of them, saying how grateful he was and how much he enjoyed singing with them. Then he remarked that he had been invited back for tomorrow night, gathered up snow shovel and lantern, and went down the path singing the soul cake song, leaving his co-workers to guess there might be soul cakes in the near future. A soul cake, a soul cake, Please, St. Alice, a soul cake, milk and oats and a bit of leaven, anything to see a soul to heaven, one for Peter, two for Paul, three for him who made us all. Charlie Horse had spent the last 38 hours being driven across England in a horse trailer, going camping in the snow, galloping to Penelope's house and back, putting up a shed between runs, making breakfast, and going shopping. He now retreated to the mat and blankets in the backyard and slept. Five hours later, he woke. All was very still. For a moment, he wondered if they had now all run away, but reconsidered. His parents would be at their work in their top floor suite, reviewing and assaying magical books and artworks. The other elders and several juniors would be at the other ends of their commutes, working. The remainder might well be out on holiday visits to friends. Of course it was quiet. He considered his evening plans and inserted himself in the breakfast kitchen in the Darnley house. Other meals were made in a second kitchen in the Arlingway house, so this one would be free. He made three dozen soul cakes, according to a simple recipe taught by Captain Fletcher. In a military such as the dedicated cavalry, treats for fairies were considered useful provisions. Chopped walnuts, chocolate chips, and icing stars added a festive touch. While they were baking, Charlie Horse squeezed through the kitchen door and explored the house. This was partly with an eye to finding a room where he could stay the night, but mainly just to look at home again. The time gap, the change in height, the care required in moving, all combined to make the place feel foreign. It was the same feeling given by looking at old pictures of places known long ago. Ah, well. There was a time for sentiment. Yes, the study would do with a little rearranging. He made no attempt to go up to his parents' suite. He went back and took out the soul cakes, leaving them in a plastic box with a label reading, Do Not Eat. He crossed to the Arlingway house. Equally quiet, maybe even more deserted. He congratulated himself on his agility. Anyone who met him in a hallway would certainly have to back up, or he would, very unwelcome thought, and there was some jostling of furniture and bric-a-brac, but there were no breakages and all jostled things were replaced. With much creaking but no accidents, he went up the stairs. Here his, his room and Aunt Lou's had been. He remembered being very little and delightedly planning games signaling his parents across the yard in the other house with flags or sign language or a tin can telephone. These had never happened. Sometimes they had waved. Here was Aunt Lou's room. He opened the door and looked in. It looked exactly as it had last summer, just before he left. One of his post-mortem conversations with her had happened in here, as had some great fraction of his childhood. Now it was neatly tidied, bed made, all the books back on shelves, all the arts and crafts material put away, but her stuff still here. The family still hesitated. Someday they would need the room for something else and someone would bite the bullet, but until then there was this seemly hesitation. Charlie Horse sighed, nodded, and closed the door. 
What about the next room, his old one? Not his any longer. He had volunteered that before leaving. It had even been in one of the cooler, more rational conversations about his decision. He certainly didn't want to squeeze up and down two flights of stairs while staying here now. What had they done with it? He opened, looked, thought a moment, and smiled. Whatever they had done or would do, right now they were using it as a Christmas gift wrapping center. Not in strange museum-like stasis, not a lumber room for things cast off. Very good. Useful, too. He had his own presents to wrap. He made the two flights squeeze down and up again, bringing the gifts, then entered and, with a little care and shoving, sat in front of the work table that stood where his bed had been. Paper, labels, ribbon, stick-on bows. He was agreeably busy. But even a hoofed giant makes little noise at such an activity, so he heard his relatives coming while they had no idea he was the here. Well, they would be surprised. They were. The door opened, and there were Alex, Bev, and his other sister, Iris. They all stared. Bev exclaimed, oh, hello, he said, carefully calibrating his tone to mild cheerfulness. I think we can all fit in with some work, or I can leave in a couple of minutes. He watched them watching him. Well, Iris was watching him, taking in all the strange details, the way people did on first sight. Last night wouldn't count for much. Alex was looking the situation over, apparently willing to consider shoving in with him. Bev had her face turned away. Yes, Bev. Charlie Horse summoned his humility and said, I'm sorry, Bev, that I snapped at you in the kitchen. That was wrong. It's just that the look you gave me... He trailed off and shrugged. You just look so revolted. I know I look very odd now, but I didn't think I looked disgusting. Bev met his eyes in one glance, looked him over again in another, then looked away but spoke to him. Oh, Charles, and it was a wail, it's not how you look, it's what you did. You, you look fine, Iris said encouragingly, maybe. Very, she groped, big, horsey, peculiar, impressive. It's just that if it were a stranger, she traded looks with Bev, and Charlie Horse realized that even if his family hadn't discussed him much, Iris and Bev had discussed him some, and each was thinking back on it now. Bev took over, forcibly turning to face him. It's, it's like one of those people who aren't satisfied until they chop off a hand or foot. Charlie Horse felt himself go white. He couldn't foretell her next exact words, but he saw what their substance would be. It's just sick. You've mutilated yourself. You got rid of your legs, your whole... You destroyed your perfectly good human body. She looked away again, crying. I didn't know it was valued, he answered softly. He began picking up boxes and gifts, stuffing them in a plastic bag. How damnable that there was no possibility of a quick exit. Bev was, clearly, grieving, not angry as she had been before he left. No, the damage was done, and there was nothing left to do but regret. He revolted her. Not in the rhetorical way that was an excuse to express contempt. She sincerely found his actions sickening. And Iris? Alex? Lily? Aunt Constance and Uncle Nathan? Did they feel the same, just less intensely? He felt shame descend on him like a familiar trap. Once again, he was a gross, awkward thing. He remembered his worst moments after the change, feeling that despite new strength and limbs and sensations and instincts, he was still himself and therefore unsatisfactory, deficient, wrong. He pushed the feeling away. He was able to now. He had peeled away layers of the old identity and put down new ones, time to use them. I see your point, he said quietly and truthfully, but I don't feel I've thrown anything away, lost anything. I've grown. This new shape is strong, fit, able. I'm skilled now and tough. I'm proud of this form. Bev did not move. She stared down the hall, weeping. Alex and Iris looked on, clearly wishing themselves worlds away. 
But you feel as you do, he went on. I can't argue you into feeling otherwise. I didn't come here to terrorize you or gross you out or punish you for not approving. I just came home for Christmas because I thought we'd like to see each other, some of us. I helped to show you I was flourishing. I am. But, well, you came to use this room. Just a moment and I'll get out of your way. He popped the last items in the bag and rose, aware of what an upheaval this was. With a muttered, excuse me, he ducked through the door past his relatives. Alex and Iris both squeezed his free hand as he passed. Goodbye, Charles, Bev said behind him. With a little effort, he could have turned far enough to look at her. He didn't. He just answered, Goodbye, Bev. And Charlie Horse will figure out what to do next, next time.